Hi, everyone. If you could take your seats, and it's perfectly fine if you're just uh, coming in, find a spot, open seating everywhere. Uh, I'm Kelly Williams. I am the chair of this year's Nantucket by Design. I first want to start by thanking all of you for being here and being flexible and kind of rolling with us, because as you know, things change, and we didn't, we didn't know we'd have a rainy day. Um, but the good news is, Everyone here is having a bad hair day, except, <laughs> except Corey Damon Jenkins. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so you're, you're in good company. Um, we are absolutely thrilled uh, to be able to bring Nantucket by Design to you in person. And um, again, we're really grateful that, uh, that you all have been so patient with us as things have changed a bit. Um, we ask you to keep your mask on during uh, during the discussion. Lunch will be served outside. When I say served, it's a grab and go, and you'll have all the direction you need to, to choose what you'd like. Um, I want to uh, first make note, all, those of you who know me know that I'm a, I'm a you know, fan for jewelry, and I'm normally dressed in Katie Jetter jewelry, but I'm really dressed in Katie Jetter jewelry today. So Katie, thank you for styling me today. If you have any questions, Katie's happy to, uh, to give you some information. Now, all of you know, as you can see here, our theme this year is renewal, and it couldn't be more apropos. Um, I think all of us have thought about the means for renewing our connections, our commitments, our relationships, our friendships, our spirit, our faith. And one of the things that's really come through this year is that interior design is not frivolous. It is actually essential <laughs> to our well-being and essential to the way that you experience your life. And so what better theme to have than renewal, because so many of us, having spent so much time in our interiors, have thought about how can I renew this? How can I make this better? And so we're thrilled to have this incredible cast of um, really world-class interior designers to talk with us this week about that theme. Now, I first want to thank our um, lead sponsor, William Ravis, and you all have these fabulous bags at your chair from them. They've been a stalwart of Nantucket by design. I want to thank our dear friends from Nantucket Looms, who are also uh, co-sponsoring this luncheon with our other friends from James Robinson. So thank you so much. I want to acknowledge the extraordinary honorary co-chairs, Gary McQuarrie and Bill Richards, who are... <laughs> Um, and, and they are, you know, they are the spirit behind Nantucket by Design all the time. You have no idea how much they do <laughs> to make this happen. So thank you both, and we're thrilled that you're both here. Um, I want to particularly thank the Nantucket by Design Committee. There is a committee. For those of you who, you know, thank me or give me accolades, it's not me. It's the committee that makes this happen. I particularly want to call out uh, Chessie Breen, who helped bring many of our speakers this year. Um, I want to call out uh, uh, Stacy Bucus, who you'll see in a few minutes, um, who produced with Mary Novissimo and our team those incredible videos. I hope you had a chance to see the videos about basket making and Nantucket gardens and antiquing on Nantucket and then the tour up Main Street. They're really fabulous. Um, and I also want to thank the amazing Olivia Charney, uh, who has, <laughs> who, has um, who has once again put together an incredible online auction. So if you haven't been online to look at it, you better go soon because the things she put together, the experiences she put together are amazing. And I want to be, you know, let you all know, be the first ones to know that as I end my term as chair of Nantucket by Design, Stacy Bucus and Olivia Charney will be your co-chairs for next year. <clears throat> so it will be phenomenal, you know that, no doubt. Um, so a lot of times when you have someone who's very renowned and famous, people say, well, this person needs no introduction. But I don't think that's fair. And I think our speaker today not, doesn't need an introduction, but he deserves an introduction because he's a pretty special person. Um, Nate Burke has started his firm at 24. 
I, didn't, I can't even remember what I was doing at 24. I, I was like a lowly associate in a law firm, but certainly was not in charge of anything. Uh, certainly not my destiny. Uh, many of us know him, um, you know, from great, gaining renown, from having, you know, worked with Oprah Winfrey and appearing on, on her show. Um, and I, of course, you know, he's been part of the design lexicon for hard to imagine decades because he seems to age in reverse. You'll notice this when he gets up on the stage. But um, my story with Nate actually comes from being in my apartment in New York, folding laundry, watching Oprah's Super Soul Sunday. I was binge watching it. And an episode came on, um, and if you know, she interviews someone and then she does a little like interest story. Episode came on where a young woman who was a high school student in a um, foster facility in Los Angeles had reached out to her and said, do you think you might be able to help us secure some new mattresses for this facility? And so Oprah said, sure. And of course, in inimitable Oprah fashion, she called Nate and Jeremiah and said, would you guys go take a look at this place and let's see what we can do. And they did an extraordinary transformation of this, um, this home for foster children in LA. And it was a great example of the impact that an interior can have on someone's life, giving these children a place to live with dignity, a place where they could study, a place where they could socialize. Was, it, it was just you know, exactly what design should be about. And so I reached out to Nate and to the incredible Kelly Engstrom, who works with him. And we put together uh, the Nate Berkus Scholars Program at the New York School of Interior Design, who is one of our partners here as well. Um, and it provides a scholarship for students who integrate into their study um, impactful design and socially responsible design. So I'm thrilled that he's here. I'm also thrilled that my friend Stacy Bucus, who, as you know, is an incredible uh, and very uh, lauded um, art director and is the founder, along with Susanna Salk, of the amazing Quintessence blog and the YouTube channel. And <clears throat> And I'm sure many of you on a day like this have binge watched it. I usually text her when I tell her I'm binge watching her. Um, but anyway, I am thrilled now to turn it over to Stacy and Nate. Thank you. Hi, Hello. everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming today. And I'm thrilled to be here with uh, Nate as our special um, luncheon speaker for Nantucket for Design, kicking off this very special week here. Um, I get tons of um, pitches in my inbox every day. And coincidentally, this morning, I got one from some outlet saying that uh, a list, giving, sending a list of the most Googled interior designers in the US, and guess who was number one? Really? <laughs> That's, thank you. <laughs> I did not know that. Thank you. Jeremiah was on the in the top uh, five as well. Was he? Yes. Let's not tell him that. No. <laughs> Wait. Well, anyway, Kelly um, um, gave you an introduction of uh, Nate's, uh, Nate's hit list, but I thought we'd start by going way back. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> this With is when little... you realize you should have reviewed the slides. <laughs> With a little okay. toothless look. Yeah, great. But there um, Nate is with his mom. And um, I actually did not know that your mom was a decorator. Yep. So what was the favorite aspect of your home growing up? I think, you know, I would I would actually answer that question in terms of what great lesson my mother gave to me okay. around design and around the importance of home. And for me, it was sourcing. My mother was and still is relentless when she wants something. Um, and so she, she in suburban Minneapolis, um, it wasn't really common to have European antique furniture, you know, French provincial things right. and French sort of cotton fabrics and things like that. 
But my mother found a way to figure out how to do that and bring that into the community. And um, I remember, well, let me phrase this in the best way. My brother, Jesse, who lives in California, who's the middle child. So, you know, he's got a lot of problems. <laughs> um, but he, um, he we'll, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. He's not watching, so I prefer to have him in the room. But he would say, um, growing up in my family, it was either shop or be left behind. Got it. So that was kind of my mother's motto. And he wanted to play sports and do everything. And I, my, I went to antique malls with my mom right. and auctions and yard sales and anything. Um, so she really actually introduced me to the secondary market. And she really, it was really important for her to fill our home and other people's homes with things that had a patina, things that had, that were, um, Things that were aged, but also things that that the neighbor didn't have or right. the same people in your social circle didn't have. And it was the hunt and the pursuit of something and her patient explaining to me over and over again why something was special in her eyes and why it wasn't, um, which she turned into a game. And that's what I that was my childhood. Well, I mean, couldn't have had a better teacher. Not at all. And I also like blame her for every nickel I spend because now all I do, especially during COVID, is just sit in bed and buy furniture online. So it's like it's and Kelly has to figure out how to ship it from God knows where. Well, as a matter of fact, as Nate and I were sitting here waiting uh, to come up here, uh, you were perusing uh, Raphael's auction coming up. Yeah. He's an auction. Yeah, that auction house, by the way, lucky, lucky all of you. Um, I, 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 I'm on Live Auctioneers, the, the website constantly, and I follow Raphael's um, house because the quality of what he gets is absolutely incredible. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's one of our secret sources. It's, it's pretty well, great. So it's pretty great. Yeah. Um, so uh, how young were you when you started trying to rearrange the furniture? So... The kid that when I was growing up um, and I would go and sleep over at friends' houses, I would, um, their parents would come home and like the living room was different. <laughs> and I did not think that that was strange. Like I did not, I didn't think that that was like a weird thing to do. And some of my parents' friends were sort of grateful and some of my parents' friends would just like look at me and be like, put it back. <laughs> like, what have you done? Um, this looks terrible. But um, I, I always did that. And right. when I was... 13, my parents gave me my own room. Um, see previous comment about middle brother Jesse, who I shared a room with. So the problem started before we shared the room and then continued after, but I had my own space for the first time. Right. And it was, I actually did a, a podcast called Meditative Story about the importance for me at 13 years old having my own space because it was my first space that was completely mine where if I left the room for school with all my little smalls and objects and things like that, and I came back from school, everything was exactly as I left it. No messy middle brother. Right. So it was, it, was, it, it was a transformative thing for me. And I would beg my mother to come downstairs. I had four pieces of furniture. Most of it was built in. And I would just move the bed to a different wall and like move, <laughs> go grab a lamp from somewhere else in the house and like do these like kind of mini Oprah-esque tadas to my mother who was like on the phone with the long cord stretching all the way down the stairs. But it, I, I've always been really passionate and I think also really sensitive to my right. environment. And it really does bother me when I look around and I see something that um, at least to my eye, feels out of balance or feels too important or not important enough. Right. So well, balance is, a, I think, a huge issue. We'll talk about that later. But um, speaking of built-ins and mm -hmm. rooms like that, uh, you went to boarding school for a while. Did you do your dorm room? Oh, yeah. Of course. <laughs> Tell us about that. Um, so my, yeah, my dorm room, I had to have those, remember those Ralph Lauren sheets that had like the bridal? They were burgundy and green. And sure. does anybody have those? I actually kind of want them back. <laughs> um, but yeah, I had to have those sheets, um, or I wasn't like going to school. Got it. Um, yeah. And so your I mother, had those. your mother obliged. She bought them for me at TJ Maxx because <laughs> she was like, I'm not buying you these from Ralph Lauren right now. She's like, you can have, if we, if you can find them at TJ Maxx, you can have them. So I, had and you them. did. Yep. Yeah, they actually have a, a, a lot of Ralph Lauren bedding. If you wait long enough, they, for it they to come I would have slept on the floor there. <laughs> I would have camped out. And then moving on. Oh, I would. I forgot. Good thing I have my notes. So I was going to ask you if you thought growing up in the Midwest, especially in Minneapolis, a, a 
had anything to do with your aesthetic now. No. <laughs> okay, that's no. a, that's a it good had to do, that it, it it is the direct source of my Dairy Queen addiction. <laughs> it is why still to this day the State Fair of Minnesota is my favorite restaurant worldwide. Got it. But what it in, had what nothing in, to do with my aesthetics. <laughs> what in particular at the State Fair? Uh, do you really want to know my list? The top uh, top three. Sure. Footlong hot dog. Yeah. Corn on the cob with Lando Lakes butter. And then they have this machine that drops mini donuts into a paper bag filled with cinnamon sugar. Oh, I never heard of that. You can't imagine. <laughs> yeah. On my deathbed, if I ever find out I have two weeks to live, I'm that's just going to lay underneath the machine. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. That's my, that's, my, that's my exit plan. Okay. <laughs> sounds good. Okay. So looking here, um, after uh, or during college, I guess it was. Mm-hmm. You uh, interned for the fashion designer Dominique Orientis in Paris. And so that was sort of an interesting, that was between high school and college, actually. And how, uh, if at all, do you think fashion informed your aesthetic? So when I moved to Paris the first time, I was uh, 19. Right. And Dominique hired me as a stagiaire, an intern, in, yeah. her, in her office. Can, and we, it was, can we still call them that now? Yeah, like it's you very nice. Stagiaire. Right, stagiaire. <laughs> but it was, um, and I, there was a very small office, and the reason that she brought me in was because she was launching a home line. And ah. so she was taking all this massive costume jewelry from the 90s that she was known for yeah. and um, turning them into napkin rings. And the showroom was, she asked me to set up the showroom. And it was an amazing opportunity. And it was actually, strangely enough, where I met design editor Wendy Goodman. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, a lot of people, actually, in the New York um, publishing world because they all came through to see it. And I was like this, you know kid basically yeah and i was in charge of like showing them and explaining where the cabochon came from and all of the stuff and it was it was a phenomenal experience um i mean fashion and design i was gonna ask has, you about that yeah, yeah. i mean uh, there's there's so many direct parallels right um and there's there's direct parallels sort of in all aspects of fashion and design fast fashion and design and fast okay. design um classic fashion and classic design i mean so you you could break down fashion and do a compare contrast to Mm -hmm. quality price rarity um longevity all of those things and i think you know as the fashion world has changed and you have people sewing things together on boats on their way here and all of these horrible things that are going on so has the world of furniture and decoration and I think that we have a responsibility to be even more careful about what we allow to cross our threshold now because, and I'm speaking as somebody who's sold many, many things at many, many mass retailers for many, many years. Right. Um, but we've always been very, very careful about um, if something was $15, it was designed to be $15. We weren't trying right. to make anything look like it was, uh, you know, Chinese export um, or as we were talking about earlier, mm-hmm. it was it was it was meant to be a fun plastic thing that you would a, put on your bookshelf. I think that's a huge differentiation because there is so much um, knockoff in the world of design. Totally. That's really, um, you know, more than a shame. It's it's horrendous, actually. And, yeah. And um, it happens all the time. And I think that's a really great qualifying element of how you approach things well there's a moral obligation because inspiration comes from everywhere but as designers and as product designers i think we have a moral obligation to be honest about what we're creating and what we're crafting and credit who we're influenced by number one but also then um you know it brings up a million things because once you can buy a towel for 15 dollars and you sell millions of those towels it's your responsibility and the retailer's responsibility to make sure that issues of ethical compliance and all of those things are, yeah. are happening. Right. Um, you know, many people have um, partnerships with with companies and things like that. Um, Corey and I were talking about Kravit and he's beginning that and my relationship with Kravit. And it's like you have to it's your responsibility to partner with 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 uh, people who move through the world with good intention. Right. Right. Well, going back to um, now, where is this, Nate? That was the living room of the Charles Street townhouse that we just sold a month ago. And I still that picture is hard for me to look at because the people that bought it who are charming and really lovely bought 
um, a lot of our furniture for the very first time. Okay, so tell that story, which we just... I'm so a little suicidal over it, so I'm not <laughs> sure if I'm strong enough. Does anyone have anything with them to get me through this question? This is um, actually... this is, uh, Nate told me about this story before. It's actually a great story, so... So we've never... Jeremiah and I and I have never in all years moving and renovating and doing all these things. We've never sold a, a home with our, our things in it ever. And this really lovely couple came... Um, our house wasn't on the market. Um, they they wanted to buy the house and they offered a really nice price. And they said, we would do this. No problem. All cash, close, goodbye, be out in July. But we want um, the majority everything. of, they would want everything. <laughs> so I had to go through the exercise, which was a bit like Kramer versus Kramer for me. Of like saying you cannot have that, like that is irreplaceable. And then Jeremiah had the great fortune of being able to go over my list, which he basically looked at me dead in the eye and said, you've lost your mind. You've lost perspective. That chair is Italian 1970s. There's 65 of them on first dibs. (laughs) Stop act. Take the money. We're taking the money. Take the money. Take the, just take, get a blonde wig and take the money. (laughs) And I, I, um, so we ended up selling that Angela Mangerati table, that white Danish mid-century chair, the French 1970s steel table. In front oh, of I can the see that you're really having an emotional. It, I think I'm going to pick a fight with him when I land. <laughs> that, that actually we did keep the black leather chair okay. and the lamp I get was a birthday present from me to Jeremiah many years ago. So, so he we said kept that, that was too. okay to keep. Yeah. And the art is ours. So right. the painting, the sculpture. <laughs> This is let's move on. So yeah. so are you <laughs> are you are you um in some way excited about like starting over? I am. I you know it's interesting again going back to your very first question about sort of what my what I learned from my mom really right. was the the issue of sourcing and um and then talking about auctions and Raphael's auction house I'm so consumed with the hunt for things. Mm-hmm. And I've never had I realized actually when we when the movers came and just brought like our clothing and our dishes and paintings <laughs> and, and that was it, um, that I had never had the freedom to start over because I mm-hmm. had developed attachments to many of these things. And anything unique or a one-off or whatever is still with us. But like a lot of the stuff that, you know, I just was used to, my eyes were used to seeing the lines and trying to reassemble them. It's been unbelievably freeing and unbelievably fun. I'm so glad my husband is not here to hear this <laughs> as I have a giant storage unit of everything from my house when we moved here. Yeah. I mean, it's, it was, it, I, I've, I still have storage units. I mean, it's, you know, it, I all over actually, but it's, I mean, it's, it, it has been cathartic in a way. Mm-hmm. And, um, and also it's challenged us to, to look at things differently and buy new things and research right. new designers and, understand a little bit deeper what we're doing because um when you have the same sofa that you've moved to four different homes and you love that sofa the question of like what sofa do you want now i never really i I don't know it just never occurred to me right so it's broadening your horizons yeah definitely it's challenging and how is it so i'll bet you when you were in that amazing house in california Mm -hmm. which was so spacious and beautiful and did you think you were going to be there forever forever that's what I thought. Yeah. And then when you moved and redid the townhouse, did you think that was the no. next? I, no. We knew you, that the townhouse wasn't forever. You did. We're okay. buying our old apartment back in New York City that right. ran an architectural digest many years ago. And that's the only reason why we sold the townhouse was because we had the opportunity to buy that back from our but friends who bought it from us. <laughs> so it's, um, I've never gone back. I'm really mad at myself because I threw out all this envelopes for the stationery. <laughs> so which we all know is like not a cheap endeavor. I'm not worried about adding staircases to a, a, a 1918 building in Manhattan. I'm worried about envelopes. So well, anyway. that is from Minnesota. <laughs> thrifty. Very yes, thrifty. Very cheap, some might say. Well, speaking of collecting um, and sourcing and um, loving things. Oh, before I get there, I was going to ask you another question. So I remember when the book came out, the Things Matter book. Yep. That was a huge deal because so many people related to it. It became a Twitter hashtag. It became a Pinterest board. Yeah. It became so that that the fact that things matter, people clearly identified and related to that. Well, I wrote the book um, and it was a series of um, 
of profiles on people whose things and homes mattered to them because at the time now it's very much part of the lexicon and everyone says your things should matter and tell your story and your home should tell your story. Yeah, yeah. I've been saying that for 25 years. Yeah. Um, they, but what was interesting to me about it is that I think that book, um, what I hoped it would do and what it ended up doing was mm -hmm. giving for me people permission to not feel shallow, to love their things. Right. Like Kelly and, said, it's yeah, not frivolous. Right. And I have seen firsthand the power of transformation, the power of design, the power through work on television, through makeovers, mm -hmm. through the work that um, that 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 Kelly was referencing as well over the last 18 years. Um, and it just bugged me mm -hmm. that everybody thought decorating was just like this, you know, grandiose, snobby mm -hmm ridiculous pastime when you see a kid who has an organized space and a, a a mom with a beautiful new kitchen and her life is forever changed from that moment on right and no better time than now for people to realize and relate to that yeah definitely. as we're all spending so much time at home definitely definitely so in terms of collecting and shopping and sourcing what is the one thing you would say that got away that you still regret Oh, um, I if, bought it back. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of but, full circles. With yeah, you. no, I am very circular um, in my thought patterns and my <laughs> behaviors, I guess. Um, no, when I was working for Leslie Hyman Auctioneers in Chicago, my first job, and I would, I was just literally had just graduated from Lake Forest College, and I was so interested in furniture and decoration, not rugs, because they always came in like filthy and there were spiders crawling and it was in the basement. And I was like, somebody else do that. But, um, but you know, smalls and silver and, and hallmarks and the history and the study and the research was always really interesting to me and fun, mm -hmm. um, that process of discovery. And there was a set of George Jensen flatware acorn pattern that for me was like the height of elegance. I was like 20, it's like your bedroom fabric, um, Jill Cargman. But it was it was like the height of like, like what I thought was the coolest thing in the world. And I was like 22 years old and making $25,000 a year. And I certainly wasn't entertaining. I don't even know if I had a sofa, but I had to have that like service for 12. <laughs> And we were allowed to bid after the absentee beds came in mm -hmm. and um, and in the live auction if we asked permission, right. like to bid, you know, to register. And so I bid and it was like $500 at the time oh for service for 12 and, and, and I had it at 500 and it sold for 550 and I didn't have the 50. So I lost it and then I went and bought it all back. I was like, I'm, you know what? I'm going to have the, you know what I'm going to have? I'm going to have the serving utensils too. And did that come with you? Yeah, I'm going to have the salad servers. Yeah. And you know what else I need? I need those tiny little butter knives. I'm going to have 12 of those as well. Cocktail. Please. Let's go for 18. Yeah. I'm not sure what this is for, but it has the same acorn. Let's do that. Yeah. And did that come with you to the new? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, that's come with me. Yeah, of course. Everywhere. Oh, yeah. And I use it constantly. We use it like not daily, but we that. use it. Yeah, of course. Because we're always talking about how you should make every day beautiful. Use Absolutely. The, use the good stuff. A absolutely. Don't wait. Yeah. Don't keep it in the closet. Absolutely. Okay. And then if we can go to the next slide, because I know that it contains the answer to this question. <clears throat> what is the one piece you'll never part with? Um, this pair of 19th century French iron lanterns because Jeremiah gave them to me for a bir my birth. We give each other lighting, which is so weird. <laughs> like who, I, who does that? Like to, that's what happens, I guess. But um, they're not even particularly that special per se, but they're, 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 they're right. The glass is original. Um, the patina is perfect. And they hung above the island. This is our kitchen in, um, in Los Angeles. Yeah. Love and, it. you know, it was just you're always that room was the most beautiful room. It was light on I three remember. sides and it was just so special. And that's what greeted me every morning. So they'll always come with me. So they're coming us. into the new house. Yeah, they'll come with us, I should say, <laughs> not just me. It's like Steve Martin in The Jerk. I'm taking these lanterns <laughs> and that book. 
I love that you have so many movie references. And <laughs> for those of you who don't know, um, obviously a cinephile you are. Yep. And that you also uh, produced a movie. I did, yeah. I um, was the one of the executive producers for the film The Help. And um, it was uh, a group of friends of mine who had um, were very good friends from childhood with the author. Mm -hmm. And um, no one was giving them any money. So it was an opportunity that I had. No one knew if it was going to be made. The book wasn't a book club book yet. No one had, you know, it wasn't traveling around to everybody's, you know, bedside table yet. And um, it was a big gamble. And it was a super exciting Oscar. Yeah, amazing. Smoking jacket, the whole thing. I was like, yay, <laughs> look at this. Who knew? So From Dairy was, Queen to the Oscars. <laughs> so that was a, that was a uh, positive experience. Oh yeah, it was incredible. And also, I'm I, you know I I have a production company and I've worked on a, a few other things. Nothing that has been that um, sort of splashy and and yeah. and big. But um, it's all about um, different social causes, different um, uh, working on an amazing story about an orphanage in Nepal. Mm -hmm. um, and so it just it's it's books that I read, things that I read that um i think could be interesting okay that's great yeah it's and fun do, do you um find films are a source of inspiration for interiors not as much as other people i think right. i like to be somewhere i like right. to be inside somewhere i want how the the windows meet the wall i want to see yeah i like it i like to feel how heavy the door is and stuff right. so it's hard for me to be inspired by something in cinema. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, so, okay, well, I'll move in because the slides are in the same order. So um, if someone asked you, would you say that you have a signature style? Um, for myself, yes. And what it's, would you say that is? I would say that it's um, neutral, right? assembled over time, a lot of patination, and a, a mix of all sort of periods and cultures kind right. of coming together um, under like sort of a very soothing kind of neutral umbrella. Right. Um, if it's vintage I, or antique, I'm drawn to that before new. I rarely right. use a reproduction. Even if it's something from 1980, I'd rather have the original right. version. Right. Um, I, 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 I really never use reproductions of, you know, English or French or or Baltic yeah. or Swedish or Austrian furniture ever. Right. Um, I just think that um, I'd rather have it be real. Right. Um, but you know, I think that we don't have my design firm doesn't have a signature style because I don't believe in crafting interiors that um, don't tell the story of the people who of actually course. live in them. So. For me, you're looking at images of, of things that I've done for, or we've done for our own homes right now. But, um, and that is absolutely those, that bedroom, we don't live there anymore. That was absolutely like, I loved waking up in that bedroom and, and the elements there. And that was the parlor in the townhouse. They didn't keep any of that, by, by the way. <laughs> No, they did actually. I'm like, I have to leave. This is her terrible. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah, I didn't realize this. Yeah, okay. This they got that Swedish so table <clears throat> and I those chairs and the mirror. <laughs> I took the sconces and the lanterns. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's very oh. traumatic. I didn't expect it. Sorry, guys. I just digress. <laughs> but I think your interiors are also, what I, as you were saying that, I think your interiors are also very informed. I, I think that that's a high, high compliment because I, that I appreciate that. Um, you know, a lot of young designers ask me, what can I do? Um, what should I be doing? And jobs are, you know, the industry is massive right now, obviously, and exploding based yeah. on the, the last couple of years that we've all had. But um, I think you're only as good as your references. Right. And, you know, I want to know. I'm, I'm, I'm intrinsically curious about... Um, furniture and decoration and why people are drawn to certain things and what excites them and what gets them, um, what, what, what delights their eye right. when it lands on it. And it's a good designer's job to know how to translate that vision on someone else's behalf. Exactly. And you can't know that without having a well-informed, well-traveled eye. You like, can't. I mean, I think that's so hugely important. And I, you know, I think, 
it's something young designers need to hear and know and um, make a habit of informing their eye. Well, you know. there's really no excuse. Um, and, you know, you can be, you can sit on it behind your Instagram account yep. and you can tag everybody else's work, but there's no replacement for being in the field and having something arrive that doesn't quite work and having to think on your feet and figure out how to make that happen or cop to it right. and take it back. Um, you know, there's an honesty around the practice of design that is not, that doesn't exist on social media. And so, you know, a lot of people on social media who have beautiful Instagram accounts, beautiful, layered, edited, their eye is unerring in, you know, and, 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 and wonderful for all of us to appreciate when they get design jobs, it's a disaster. Because uh, there's I no infrastructure. Tell you several of them. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we won't name names. Some, some no. I mean, everybody's starting somewhere, Absolutely. and now everybody has the opportunity to start wherever they are comfortable with. Right. But, but you, you know, you. I've spent 25 years building relationships with painters and yep. mill workers and people that know how to lay the interior fire brick in a fire in a chimney, and right. you know that is that's important stuff. Very. And what <clears> would you say? Um, is the hardest thing to get right in general when you're doing an interior? The hardest thing to get right. Um, it's changed for me over the years. Okay. Um, f first it was fireplaces <laughs> were impossible for me. And then finally I, I had to like force myself to sit down and look at historic homes and how the interior fire brick was laid and what, if you had an old chimney, what was the proper stone to use for the hearth? I mean, there are 60 decisions. How right. wide should the grout be? What right. pattern should it be? Yeah, um, for those people who say there are no rules in design, that's just wrong. Well, there it, you can choose to ignore them, right, but, but it's like an artist going to paint some, and like, like you taught in painting in, 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 in art school, how to paint an apple before you paint a portrait of somebody. So you can choose to totally ignore that and 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 you should if that's what right. you want to do. But but I think you should know what the rules are before okay. you choose to break them. Kind of them. like manners. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> like no one needs to see you, you know, uh, eating your soup like a crazy person. Well, I mean, you should yeah. know it. You can choose to right. ignore it. Exactly. For when Ex you you should know it. Right. You right. should know it. Right. <clears throat> um, so what do you think? Oh, so the fireplace. And what do you think most people get wrong? Um, hardware, like window hardware, door hardware, hinges, all of those details, window chains. Yeah. Um, I think that they let the contractor pick it or the, the or it's just glossed over. And, um, I have like a real sensitivity to that. Like I will, I will, I will stay online until I'm half blind trying to find knobs. I love hardware. Yeah, I do too. It's like super, give me an architectural salvage thing. I was, when we renovated the house in California, there's a place called Liz's Antique Hardware in Los Angeles that's very well known and they have an amazing inventory. And I would just come out of that place like covered in black, so like up to my elbows and Jeremiah, we, we would always drive past it and Jeremiah would say, uh, I would say, can I just run in for like 10 <laughs> minutes? And he'd be like, I'll drop you off. You can Uber home. Because he knows. Because it was, oh, oh yeah. I'd be like, I, all I need is like that little kind of thing for poppies, like, you know, and he'd be like, no, 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 no. I'll pick you up in nine hours. But I think, I think designers who really love the hunt are the best. I, I think I would agree too. I think it's, I, I think that the, you can craft any style for anyone. If you spend the time with that person to get to know them um, before you start. And then if you add that sort of relentless pursuit of the perfect object, it's just something that I identify with. I mean, I don't know how to do anything any other way. Right, right. And so uh, one of the things I was going to ask you, but I think you already answered it, is how do you make a, uh, a home look not decorated, but that it's evolved over time. Um, so I think the easiest way for like, well, for a television makeover, you have to use and incorporate old things. Right. Um, and then you also have to have a certain amount of someone's personal right. 
things, whether it's their books, their photographs, their um, little boxes, even, you know, their grandmother's dishes on the wall or in the bookshelf in the dining room, whatever it is, it can't really all be picked by you. Paintings, drawings. I mean, it it really just can't all be picked (laughs) by you. If it's all picked, it's why in Europe, like they barely use historically, no one has a decorator. Right. Everybody's just like, well, we have that tablecloth. That'll work. Right. And, and it happens to be beautiful. But I think, um, I think that it's, um, you know, part of the deep dive and part of the most successful design projects that I've ever had are the ones where the clients were so engaged right. that they became collectors throughout the process and they would become as excited as I was to find something. And then they'd be equally as excited to dig in their storage or to dig in their um, inventory of things or to go to their mother's or their grandmother's house and bring something that then would have just from the sheer juxtaposition of that in a new environment, that object, that terrain, that painting, whatever it was, um, revolutionize the space. Right, exactly. But that says something about you, too, the fact that they were excited to do that. Yes. Well, I ask for it. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I mean, we sit down and I, I will say, well, what do you, what have you got? Yeah, right, you know, right. let's talk about what you have. Right. Exactly. Um, what in general you think is the hardest thing you had to learn as a designer? Um, how to walk away from a project graciously. And that was my next question. Yeah. So you <laughs> was, <laughs> have you ever said no? How and why? Um, I have said no. Graciously is the how. <laughs> graciously. Yes. Graciously. I'd like to believe um is the how not everyone in the world might agree with that statement but um it's a really that you know that's a really difficult it's a very difficult situation that every designer faces and uh, many clients face as well um and i think that it's um honesty is always the best policy and i've fired clients because they can't make up their mind And that's just really, you know, they have to respect that it's a creative endeavor, that there's an energy around the process. There's a relationship that you're building, not with them, but also with the space. And do they understand that when you say that to them? Um, They understand when I say I'm not, I can't do this. No, that that, that I'm I'm firing you because you couldn't make up your mind. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they do. I mean, I think that, you know, and 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 um, listen, it's hard. It's a very vulnerable position for both designer and and the homeowner i get it um but honesty is the best policy and you know also if it's not clicking it's such an intimate process it's such a long process it's like being on a bad date that never ends so you know at some point somebody's got to ask for the check and was there ever anyone when you told them that they were like really upset and tried to reason with you (laughs) yeah i mean i think that they there and and you know there we've I'll sometimes I've caved and said okay let's give it you know another presentation and we'll right. see how that goes but the 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 fundamental thing in any designer client relationship is um is joy and trust okay and so good. without those two elements it doesn't work yeah it should be a fun process it, it it's should... horrible if it's not fun right i mean it is it is like dental if it's not fun (laughs) and it it, you know think about it like you know you're sitting across from somebody writing them checks they're like spending hundreds of thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars or ten dollars whatever it is but why would you waste your time right and so without the joy and without the trust you don't you can't have any joy um and you know i've i've had to say to you know very rich very important people um i know you don't trust me I can feel it. And I don't want to be in this position. We've been together for three months or four months. It's not, it, why? It's not, it's not fun. And do you think it's sometimes an ego thing? For them? Yeah. Um, I yeah. actually would respect that okay. because there's a lot that I know I can't do. I can't make myself a grilled cheese. I can't operate <laughs> on someone's brain. Like I, you know, there's a lot, I've done very limited skill set over here. Um, and I'm good with that. But I, I, um, I don't think necessarily it's ego. Okay. I think it's um, I think it's a little bit the industry and historically how there's been you know controversy about pricing and people's credibility and honesty, yeah. which I think every designer is kind of up against, which is a bummer. Um, I think it has to do with that a little bit, and then I think it also has to do with um, 
a lot of rich people think that people are trying to screw them. Right. And that's a really sad way to move through the world. And I, you know, I'll say to somebody, here are all the original invoices. Like, you know, that here, take a look, guys. We're working our butts off for you. <laughs> right. and, and you keep thinking you're going to catch us doing something. We're not, there's nothing to catch. Right. The only and thing I, to catch is a living room. Right. <laughs> and now more than ever with people online all the time, I think transparency and design is a. You, you know, have to be. Yeah. You have, and we've always been my right. firm for 25 years. Um, we give every client a binder. It has every original invoice where every single piece came, came from. Right. We've resold things for, on behalf of clients. We, Kelly and I work on that all the time when they move, when they downsize, whatever it is. Um, but they have the history. They have the paper trail. That yeah. paper trail is important, especially when you're working with vintage and antique, yeah, absolutely. antique furniture and lighting and things like that. You want to know where it came from and who made it and how many there were and who was the dealer. You have to have that stuff. Well, for provenance, for absolutely. insurance, for Abs anything. A hundred percent. So in looking at these slides of your various uh, projects and homes, we discussed how in general you have sort of a neutral palette, but obviously use color for clients. But yeah. is there a color you would never use? Um, red. Interesting. Yeah. And, and why? Sorry, guys. <laughs> Boy, am I on the wrong island. Um, <laughs> no, I think I think blue would have been worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, blue and navy blue. <laughs> Never Yuck. use navy blue. Um, especially with white. <laughs> Ick. Um, no, um, no, I actually love that was my grandmother's whole house. But um, I, I just have a really hard time with red. And there's designers and friends of mine who who use it so beautifully. Alessandra Branca right. from you know who's a good friend. Um, and I'm, and I'm, and I see it sometimes and I think it's magnificent and mm -hmm. I, I've been in people's homes where it's magnificent. Um, just I just don't do want to live you. with it. Yeah, yeah. I just, I, I can't do it. And with our children's wall covering and in their rooms, there's red within like, you know, multicolor, but even designing for Kravit when I had to do multicolored right. fabric in one fabric, several colors in one fabric, it was like a breakdown for me. <laughs> I was sat that's, that's crying with the Kravit research team. I'm like, you have to take two of the colors away. And they're like, then it's not a multicolor. Then it's two <laughs> colors. I was like, what if we just, what if it was camel and stone? Would that work? They were like, no. I, I remember, um, and that was actually very um, insightful for me when I came to hear you talk about your uh, fabric collection at Kravit, yeah. uh, which was a lot of neutrals, I yeah. must say. Um, but um, hearing you talk about your inspiration for the collection is pretty much everything we've been talking about. Yep, always. It had a lot of travel. It had a lot of... Um, you know, obviously craftsmanship and um, handmade, you know, not that fabric was handmade, but you know, that kind yeah, of- some, some elements of it were. They right. Were, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the collection was called Well Traveled and it was, um, you know, I'm on my fifth passport. So, you know, I've, I'm insatiable. This has been really hard for me to be sort yeah, of grounded. Um, but it's, you know, I, I love when I'm traveling to go into the local markets. I don't want anything that anyone's ever designed to be a souvenir ever. So I don't want a snow globe. I don't <laughs> want an Eiffel tower. I don't want any of it. Um, I don't want one of those little spoons and not. Have, so I, I like to go to like the market where the people in that country buy their pots and pans right. and their placemats and they're the cheapest coolest potato sack equivalent textile um and have shipped bolts and bolts and bolts of that back from lima like it's just it's it's it that's what's interesting to me and where do you if you had to pick one where would you say your favorite place to shop has been um or is that too hard no it's not too hard okay. um it's I mean, I'll, I, I'm I, everywhere I go. That's right, what, I mean, that's, you know, I'm not playing football. <laughs> so like, I'm not like, hey, guys, want to get a little team together? We can play out on the grass. Oh, wait, a flea market. Oh, <laughs> going to be late. Um, but, um, it, you know, now it's online. And, okay. I, you know, the truth is now it's online, like to the point where and this is also where like the, you know, thrifty comes in. Yeah. Um, we were at an, a wedding in Rome. Um, year before last and with Poppy and we were standing outside of Bucciolati 
And I oh, said, that's a tough place to be with a little girl. Yeah, right. No, she was in, she was like, I want that. I was like, you have no idea what you're asking for. <laughs> but, um, the, um, we were standing outside of Bucciolati and, and I, I wanted Poppy to go in because I wanted her to see all the animals and everything that they make. And yeah, there's, you know, where fantasy meets design and yep. she's, you know, whatever. So she's six and she was sort of interested. She was five at the time. And then I went outside and bought two Bucciolati bowls on the real, real on my way out the door, on the way back to the hotel. I didn't have to carry them. Okay. They were waiting for me when I landed. And, you know, I just, I, so it, for me, it's like, go out, see it, yep. make the decision of what's important, what quality matters to you, okay. what makes you happy, and then do the work when the kids are in bed to figure out how to find it for a great price. <laughs> Obviously, sometimes like things you found in Lima, Peru, you can't necessarily no, that, find yeah. online. No, that, I mean, honestly, Mexico for me, I think is one of my favorite countries in the world. Um, colonial Mexico, the markets, um, the central highlands, Morelia, Guanajuato, um, those towns, mm -hmm. that area, those areas where it's, it's, there's nothing acrylic for miles. <laughs> it's all wood. It's all, you know, it's all wool and Could catch cotton. On fire. And yeah. Oh, a hundred, right. <laughs> nothing. Sh there's no shine, not shine. There's nothing. The pottery is not shiny. Right. Pineapple pottery isn't shiny. Um, and Mexico, there's there, there's just randomly a million things, Mexican mid-century, and that's been like a, an area that I'm sort of insatiable. Mexico City, one of my favorite cities in the world. Oh, I'm actually dying to go there. Uh, if you go, uh, you, we have to connect on okay, it because I'm happy to, we should just put that on my blog because that was really rude. Anybody who wants to go to Mexico City, I have a couple of suggestions. <laughs> um, okay, so now is that the uh, house in, in LA? No, that's Montauk. Oh, that's, that's our house. Talk. We okay. still own all of those for, all those pieces. Okay, luckily, so we'll get there. We'll get there yeah, in a no second. No one came and took them from us <laughs> in the night. <laughs> so what what precipitated your move back from L.A.? We just really hated L.A. Okay. Interesting. I mean, yeah, we I have just to say, didn't I could like never it. Live there. No, we just. Did I love not. visiting. I'm from there. I'm born there. My brothers and their wives and their children, my stepmother, they're all down further south now. But um, I have a huge extended family there. And the, the story we wrote for our family of, of living in Los Angeles was just not the story we found. Got it. And we realized that our children spoke to the same six people yeah. every day and um, didn't hear any other languages. Didn't. It was this sort of very insular um, Poppy was at a great school, um, but it just, it was a huge, enormous effort. Nothing was spontaneous. It was absolutely miserable for well, us. Well, yeah, the, the driving. Horrible. Yeah. And I mean, I, the day, the weekend we moved back to New York City, I went, I think I had my teeth whitened. I had a haircut. <laughs> I dropped things off at the dry cleaner. I bought a new book. Um, All without driving. I got gum at CVS <laughs> and, and hand something, and I was home in 40 minutes. Right. Like, I was like, I, I'm never leaving this place. Yeah, I don't true. have the patience to live in California. I right. really don't. And, and okay, so you're, but your aesthetic is pretty consistent, but how would you say the aesthetic in design aesthetic in LA differs from the design aesthetic in New York? Um, I don't, well. Not necessarily I, yours. Yeah, no, just, in general, yeah. yeah. I think, um, you know, LA is interesting in that it's fueled primarily by the entertainment industry right, of, of which i'm a part of so you know right. at least i'm not looking for an agent but it was you know it's a very weird town in that way and i think what happens more so in los angeles than in new york is that um people clients get fixated with certain looks and that look just stands around for too long Right. Initially, it's interesting, uh, genre chairs yep. around a, you know, a Royer mm -hmm. this and a, a cream rug. And then all of a sudden, every dinner party you go to is the same. Mid-century French. Same, <laughs> yes. And it's only the same, and not only mid-century French, but it's like eight pieces. <laughs> I don't know where it's all coming from, actually. I mean, much of it was industrial furniture, but right. still, I'm like, what is, like, wow, like, the, the, how many Royer polar bear chairs are there on earth? Right. That every single dinner I've been to this week, everybody's got a pair. Like this is <laughs> fascinating. Um, so it's it's um, it, it it that was sort of my issue with it. It's I I find it to be a little bit less individualistic, maybe yeah. a little bit less personal. Um, people move more. 
Right. Um, the market's a little bit fierier, more more fiery there. Mm -hmm. So um, it just it feels it felt it felt more transient design wise than New York. Got it. Okay, that's interesting. Interesting take on things. And of course, here is Poppy's bedroom, right? Yep, that's Color. Poppy's room. Color. Color. And, and well, she's red, in, she's in charge of the whole that. It's not red. It's pink. <laughs> Um, but that table actually is red. That, that okay, table in a client's a apartment. A very Nantucket red. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, yeah, that is red. Um, funny, but I, re I really like it in that room. So, <laughs> um, no, Poppy picked almost, not picked, but she was consulted on the color of her carpet and the color of her bed. And oh, I was going to ask you about that. So you did let her have input. Yeah, totally. How do you feel about letting kids have input when you're working with a client? Yeah. I think it's important. Um, I think it's within reason. You know, our son wants an orange and yellow bedroom. That's not happening. Right. He's three. He's very persistent about it. Jeremiah actually painted this room at our house in Montauk, like this terracotta color. Yeah. And said to Aki, Aki, look, it's 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 orange, your favorite color. And he, he said, that's not the orange that I like. Oh, budding designer, so, yeah. budding designer. Yeah. Um, so he... Um, so, but I do think that it's important to engage kids because I think it's important for them to grow up having the language of aesthetics and having the, having some say in their surroundings. Um, you know, a little kid, it doesn't, the room, you don't have to paint their room, their favorite color, just cause they want you to do that. You can buy sheets that you can, you know, get right. rid of it, whatever, but be smart about it. But I think I always sit down with the kids and engage with them and I will try and make it fun. Like with these nightstands with Poppy, I said, you know, somebody hand painted those, those, just like when you were in art class and you were making those paintings, somebody right. actually painted this furniture 200 years ago. And isn't that isn't that cool? Like, you know, that you um, look at that like that's a bird. And, you know, so she she I heard her tell a friend, I have birds on my nightstands. And I was like, <laughs> oh, great. You know, she's engaged. She's got right. a sense of ownership. Right. <clears throat> and uh, I think we wanted to go to the next slide. Uh, no, the next one, please. Oh, I think we're a little behind. I was going to ask you, and it's coming, and when it comes, I will point it out. But I wanted to ask you, if you could live anywhere, where would it be? This is such a weird answer, but there is this house yeah. in Los Angeles. That's it. There it is. Um, I don't know why I'm drawn to it. I've tried to buy it twice. And, I called the lady that what lives is there. It? Okay, Waldo Fernandez built it, I believe, for yeah. himself. Okay. In maybe 30 years ago but it's a single story home um with 16 foot ceilings throughout high high uh you can see the scale of the front doors yeah, it's love all that. brick with a clay tile roof the entire exterior is basically pea gravel because it's in beverly hills right off of sunset boulevard behind a gate and it's not enormous um you know I'm, maybe it's 3500 feet i think Oh, um, I try, I've tried to buy it twice. I called the lady that lived there when we were moving to LA and she was like, right. no. Uh, no, I tracked her down. <laughs> I figured out who she was and called somebody that had had lunch with her and she like answered my call. But, um, then she subsequently sold it when we moved back to New York, but of there's course. something about the house that I just, and what, what is it exactly? Obviously it's got an organic feel and your design is very organic. It doesn't feel American. Okay. You know, and I don't think I think it's like it's there's there's something about the quality of the building materials that went into it that you feel like and the scale of the rooms and the scale of the ceilings. And there's something to me that's so elegant mm -hmm. about a high ceiling, single story home. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's and a brick home like a, or a stone home. Right. I just and the gardens are all like sort of perfect and it would be what would be weird for me if i were ever to own the house which i don't think i ever will right um but would be to what i would change and what i would keep because it's it would be a real sort of quandary for me right i understand that and how do you feel because i'm noticing now that tapestry in the back would you can you ever imagine a scenario where you would use tapestry 100 percent Okay. In fact, we're doing uh, new offices. Jeremiah and I are sharing offices in, in new offices in New York City. And there's this contraption that lifts the tapestry over a flat screen TV. Oh. And we have a, a 17th century Flemish tapestry that I bought online. Um, <laughs> I'll let you know when I see it, if it's like covered in, you know, eaten, if it's half eaten or not. But, um, but we're doing that over a very modern French uh, sideboard and a pair of lamps and mix. that's it. Yeah, for sure. I, listen, for me, if it's made by hand, 
Yep. That is the first thing you. that draws me in. I saw when we were looking at Raphael's <laughs> catalog, like, it, you know, when somebody is made by hand, when you can see the craftsmanship of and, something, and a human I'm connection. so, yes, I'm so drawn to it. So yes, I would never rule out a tapestry. I would never rule out early English furniture. I would never rule out anything. Um, right. Cause if it's beautiful, I think you can make it's it work. Timeless. Yeah. And if you weren't a designer, what would you be? Um, I would be a singer, and I've prepared this for, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I would be, Ari, would you like to come up with me? We could do a little duet. Um, do you know Islands in the Stream or no? Um, I would be an estate jewelry dealer. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, not, a, not a jewelry designer. No, I don't want to design it because I would wreck it. I, I like, yeah, I like, I don't, I mean, I, I can I modify certain things, but I, I don't wear really jewelry per se, but, um, but I, I, I collect it. Oh, um, I didn't know that. Yeah. And I think it's, um, I think it's an incredibly fascinating thing. And I love so much, obviously the hunt comes in for that because it's in, endless and, and, and such, but, um, I love that it's the mix of these materials in an really incredibly artful and small way and how tangible and transportable it is. I think there's something just incredible about stones and- So what and, kind of things do you collect since you don't wear it? Um, yeah, um, <laughs> I, 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 well, my collection's gotten, I've been improving on it okay. um, gradually. When I sign a big deal, I usually buy something that I, I think is going to be important or, or it already is important. Um, what, what do you mean by that? Like a single, like a, like I wasn't, I was avoiding big stones for a long time because okay. I couldn't afford it. And I thought that was, you know, and then I realized I was buying all this stuff that I might as well just buy like something that's seven carats or whatever it was. Okay. So. Um, so I, I, I've, I've been collecting stones, gemstones, diamonds, emeralds, things like that, okay. mainly diamonds and emeralds, but I, I, just the stones, I usually take them out of this. So the settings are usually really pretty brutal. Okay. Um, it's, and it's all again, auctions online. Right. And what are you um, planning on doing with them? Well, Jeremiah turned like a diamond into a necklace and had our four initials, the four initials of our family put on the back of the, nice. the, and, and wears it but it look i don't it doesn't look right so he's he know he knows that might get redesigned um, my mother was like what is that <laughs> um like, what's happening um jerry was like what i'm run dmc i'm like mom, <laughs> mom um he um but i i like signed jewelry from the 60s and 70s the 50s 60s and 70s like elsa peretti um not so much Elsa Peretti because okay. it was so give me too, another example. there's too many things. Oh, okay. So more, Although, some more um, esoteric. Old David, David Webb, Suzanne Bell Perone. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, Who doesn't love Van that? Van Cleef and Arpels, but like old. Did you see that Van Cleef exhibit the at the Cooper Hewitt? I couldn't even talk about it. It was I mean, unbelievable. That was the most. And, and it was, how about the um, exhibit space? It was the way that that show was set up it, was mag so it was refined. It was blowing, beyond right? beautiful. Anybody I couldn't who even. Has not I couldn't seen even it believe it, or doesn't know about it. Look it up. It yeah, was. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. So it's that stuff that I'm interested in, and um, and it's fun for me. It's fun for me to find it. It's fun for me to sort of own it. Um, I wonder if my daughter will ever wear it, like if right. she'll love it or if she'll be like lucky poppy. Yeah, yeah, but we'll <laughs> see. Like she might. Jeremiah thinks she'll wear nothing. Like he's he's convinced that she won't care at oh, all about I any of it. I somehow but, doubt that. I think he's wrong too, actually. Yeah. I think she's going to be like, I think she's, I think she's going to look like. Something in your collection will appeal to her. Oh yeah, for sure. But I already like picked out earrings for her for a wedding. <laughs> we'll see. It's like the dad who buys the wine for the wedding. Yeah, you know, totally. Decades ahead yeah, of time. Exactly. Um, okay. So uh, we know what you would do. Who is your, if you had to pick a design crush, can't be Jeremiah. Who would it can't you pick? be Jeremiah. Cannot be Jeremiah. Um, a design crush. Probably okay, Jacques get, Grange. Jacques Grange. That's yeah. Not, that's somehow not surprising. Yeah, for sure. I think. I. I mean. I. I look at his work, and um, I would Windex his floor. Like <laughs> I, you know. Like I. I just. I think that the mastery of what of what 
he's done and the quality of how he's assembled these spaces. I mean, Yves Saint Laurent's apartment oh. in Paris was absolutely incredible and magical, and he was working with. Oh yeah, that was you know, a mind incredible. Um, and and a lot of his work has been incredible. Right. I've been in a few of his interiors, um, and um, and they 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 just they they you walk in and it just sings. Okay, I've got just got the sign that we have to wrap up, so I have two quick questions. Sure. If you had a house on Nantucket, what would be your must-haves for the house? If I had a house on Nantucket, <clears throat> I, I mean, I think I would go pretty hard with American primitive furniture and not a lot of color. You know, <laughs> I, I, I really would. I think it would probably be all whites. No navy? I don't think so. No, I don't think I would do it. No. Okay. And in decorating, then lastly, in decorating a house in a location on Nantucket, uh, like Nantucket, how do you give it a sense of place without it becoming cutesy or hackneyed? You know, for me, I think that it's so much more important that the interior reflect the spirit of the family or the people that live there. That if hackneyed is what they're after, because the fantasy was to have the gingham, you know, wicker, well, Scrimshaw, <laughs> well embroidered, well embroidered <laughs> everything, um, then they should have that. Okay. And I think that there's, but you know, there's, there's obviously ways every designer is going to come in and interpret that differently. Right. Um, but I also think that if, if, if somebody wants a, you know, a John Pawson monastic okay. wide floorboard home with a tiny reveal on a white plaster wall here, they should have that too. And somebody who doesn't know that reference, you can look that up. That was interesting. Um, okay. Well, Nate, thank you so much. It was My great. My pleasure. Uh, you. <laughs> and do we have time for any questions? Two questions. Anybody? Oh. Hi, Nate. Um, Hi. I'm not sure if you remember me, but you flew me from Nantucket, and we did a show together in New York. Mm. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I reached out to you and told you that I had uh, designed and built my own house out here and didn't have any money left over to mm. decorate. So my house is decorated from the take it or leave it on, at the dump here. And Do you know you, about that? Mm -hmm. You had me ship furniture from the dump that you, your team repurposed and flew me out, and uh, I had a lovely time. I'm so glad. It was a wonderful experience. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. One more? Anybody? Uh, oh, way over there, Stacy. Oh, there. Will you be producing any more TV shows or any, anything new coming up? Uh, yeah, Jeremiah and I just finished um, the what was sort of the fourth time we've filmed the show together, but we've changed the concept of the show and the network that it's on. Um, so we'll be premiering a new show called The Nate and Jeremiah Home Project uh, this October on HGTV. And Which is, by the way, weird for me that I've spent 25 years in television, 20 years in television, and have never been on HGTV until this year. <laughs> It was like, I was like, they, they were like, mm, no, we're going to pass. I'm like, what, what, why? Like, well, you know, got these other people, these nice people from Texas. I was like, what about me? No, somebody else. We need somebody else. We know who those nice people from Texas Not are. Not you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, we didn't, uh, I, I ran over. It's my fault. Um, we didn't get a chance to talk about it, but just very briefly mention your new collections. Um, we've, well, they're. You know what? I'm going to let everybody go on my Instagram. Okay, at there you go. It's much easier. I wanted to give you a yeah. chance. And, yeah. Okay. No, my pleasure. Okay. And then, back when I was a child, <laughs> I think they've heard enough. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.